What's up, gentlemen? Welcome back. It's good to see you again on another episode of the uh, Blind Pig, courtesy of BGObsession.com. Happy to see you. We're running six again tonight. Uh, real quick, we'll run through the intros for those watching. Top left is Mark. He hails his own. Bottom left is Paul. You can hail his Canadian hog. Bottom middle is Chris. Uh, he hails his Chris. He's the intuitive one. Bottom right is Bob. He hails his neophyte. Top right is Boone. You can call him John and I'm Derek. I hail his silent threat. Come to the board, subscribe, jump on, become a member, have some fun, mix it up. Um, there's hey, like nothing to talk about today, so it's going to be short and sweet. I just want to mention, if we can get three more guys on the pod, then we can sing the BGO bunch to start out. That's, that's right. I don't I was thinking middle we could be, <laughs> but we have to look thinking, down. Like, oh. <laughs> I was thinking we could be Hollywood Squares and all have a smart-ass answer. Oh, <laughs> Well, never yeah that would never work with this group. <laughs> um, well yeah that's because right, well, we can't get paul to be a smart ass we just need paul to talk um but, but <laughs> i'm just kidding sorry smart ass um I, there's a plethora of conversation to have i guess the first thing we have to get into anytime you beat the cowboys you have to kind of applaud it yep. um and Rebel. you can Dig deeper later, it only cost us two draft positions, which is even better. We didn't drop to, you know, 21 and instead of 12, we were at 16. And had we lost, we would have been at 14. So that's cool. And then embarrass them as they're getting ready to go to the playoffs and watch every news and media outlet say, do we need, do the Cowboys need to panic entering the playoffs because of how badly they lost to us? So fun to see. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk about how, but. Just your guys' initial quick reaction to the game, and then we can kind of tee this thing off. It's just so yeah. typical. I mean, I think that's got to be what we all felt like. None of us – I mean, even I'm even i even I'm, I'm prone to throw out the, you know, I, I want to look smart, so I'll throw out the unlikely Atlanta scenario. Credit union. Can't imagine where we'd be without them. But I, w I didn't throw that out as a possibility. I, you know, I was surprised – I was surprised. Um, and that's production value great. right there. <laughs> <laughs> you totally broke John's train. Of that's thought. all right. That's all I had to say. I was surprised. I'll put it that I, way. I was surprised. And I was, I was sitting on the couch next to one of my best friends down here. Who's actually a, a cowboy fan. He and I do, do uh, home and away every year. Right. So when the Cowboys host Washington, I go to his place. And when Washington hosts the Cowboys, he comes to my place. My exact words when he sat down on, the, on my couch with a beer was, I don't expect much today. We're starting a rookie quarterback, and you guys have everything to play for, and we have nothing to play for. They dropped that first punt. Scott looked at me and went, we're going to lose this game. <laughs> <laughs> he he sounded a like Washington a Washington fan. fan. He's like, we're losing. I was going to say, how often have we said that? Oh yeah, he sounded he he would <laughs> it, it, it change the colors from blue and white to burgundy and gold, and change the name on his lips from Cowboys to Commanders. And so help me God, he sounded exactly like one of us. He would he would fit right in here, except that he's a Cowboy fan, and he he was just. I mean, I, I kid you not, we were up thirteen nothing, and he said, "We're not coming back from this. There is no way." This is just not happening. This team does not have the mental makeup to win this game at this point in time. And I, and I said, ah, yeah, but you know, and I argued with him because I just knew, right. Cause well, I'm a Washington fan and we melt down all the time. I was going to say, which, which team is going to have the bigger collapse. It, exactly. <laughs> which teams could have the bigger collapse. Right. And, and, and it never happened. And, you know, we got to <laughs> halftime and he's like, told you, you're not you're not losing this game you're gonna win this game and and but that was different man we're used to seeing the cowboys choke in key moments we're not used to seeing them like totally not show up at all that i i haven't seen anything like that in a long time i'm sure i'm not the only one who's thought this this week but they they turned in the equivalent of our game last week against cleveland that's what yeah. i saw this is the big they, they showed up for whatever reason or series of reasons not ready to play a football game um, and when they got down early and the brakes started going against them, they had no reserve to fall back on. Um, so that's the negative view of it. The positive view to me is that going shorthanded, I mean, we went into that, into a gunfight with a, with a Nerf ball 
<laughs> with you know a rookie quarterback starting and we're missing starters all across the board on both sides we had no reason to show up and play it hard but they did so but why we went, well, what what do you attribute that to oh, that's what i want to hear from you guys what, yeah that's what, i want to talk about you, that because i'm on the one hand I'm, I'm happy to see that on the other hand uh, i think they they talked about this on the broadcast yes, i'm really irritated not. that we didn't show up last week that way because then this game really would have meant something so not just that, last week three of the last four yeah. weeks if we yeah, showed up in any one of the new york like, games any one of either of the New York games or the Cleveland game, we're in. We're playing this next weekend. This is a very different one that, podcast tonight. To me, the one that's going to stick is Cleveland. New York, for all that we want to, I mean, the familiarity breeds contempt and all that. That's not a bad football team. They, they're just pretty much as good as we are, as far as I'm concerned. Cleveland, we had no business losing that game, too. And I think that had to do with the whole Wentz and, and the locker room situation. But we'll have to get into that, too. Yeah. So speaking about that, Mark, just to piggyback off what you're saying uh, in regards to my reaction to the Dallas game, obviously very, very surprised, pleasantly surprised, I would say. Um, but a week ago when we played Cleveland, or I should say two weeks ago now, um, I may have made a suggestion on here that maybe I was starting to see the first signs of questioning if that locker room was starting to quit on Ron Rivera. Um, and if you ask me going into that get Dallas game, I would have said we're going to lose by a good 20 to 30 points in that game. I was very pleasantly surprised in the sense that we had nothing to play for, but those guys still put it out there. They laid it out all in the line. And to me, that shows that there is still a level of respect and admiration towards our head coach. I don't know if that means anything moving forward uh given the uncertainty of our ownership situation and such but it was really really nice to see uh, a group of players that didn't quit in that situation and um you know didn't lay down to a team that had absolutely everything to play for so um yeah those are my reactions in regards to that dallas game if that game had been played in miami instead of in maryland rumors would have been flying that the entire Dallas team was in the clubs on South Beach into early in the morning, Sunday morning, and the Dak Prescott was in the champagne room. <laughs> um, I, I can't explain their performance. Today, on a side note, today the NFL players put out their own all-pro list, and their all-pro punt returner was Turpin from Dallas who tried to catch a punt with his helmet. <laughs> um, these guys clearly were not ready to play or not interested in playing. Um, very impressed by the effort that, uh, that Washington played with, but I can't explain their opponent at all. You know, if it had been one or two guys, but it was the entire blessed Dallas team, the whole team, Micah Parsons was, didn't yeah. look like he was there, you know, and Parsons Parsons is a high motor guy. Hell, Parsons is a high motor guy in interviews, much less on the field. <laughs> yeah, you know, is. and in Pollard was the only cowboy that looked like he was <laughs> that he was ready to play. And Pollard always looks ready to fight somebody. Yeah, I would add C.D. Lamb to that. That guy, that guy's a beast. I think he plays his ass off. But, you know, yeah, but even he had a couple of drops, didn't he? I, I think there was there was a ball or two that my buddy was just shaking his head of it. It's like, I don't know why he dropped that. We had our share of those too, didn't we? <laughs> I mean, just, 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 the two, all people. just the two play is in a row of Kendall Fuller dropping mm -hmm. six, six. Yeah. And then Prescott throwing the exact same pass again, two times in a row for a pick six. It, it almost looked to me, I mean, thinking back on it now, it almost looks to me like they came into that treating it like a preseason game. I'm not sure they even game planned for it. It looks like they were just kind of going through the motions on both sides of the ball. I don't think they attacked our rookie quarterback particularly well. Mm -mm. And clearly offensively, they were just they were out of sorts. So that, that one swing pass out to Elliott, to Zeke on a third down out in the left flat where he doesn't even turn around. He's just running alone up the sideline for a big first down gain. 
And he doesn't even turn around until after the ball hits by his feet. It was just, it was kind of bizarre. I'd be worried if I was a Dallas fan. Uh, and that, and, and my buddy is, he's like, he's like, we aren't, we won't get out of the first round again. He's we'll lose in the first round. And, and I'll tell you, if there's one guy in Dallas that needs to be worried at this point in time, I think it's Mike McCarthy. Yeah. You know, I mean, his, yeah. his team, his team's been fading for the last three weeks, but Jerry Jones says he's, his job's not in jeopardy, but you know, I guess that could change. That's kind of the kiss of death when the owner comes out and says your job's not in jeopardy, though. Especially <laughs> Jerry Jones. Didn't he say the same thing? Same thing about Jason Garrett and the same thing. Everybody. I, I think it could have the opposite effect. I think it. I think that. I think they were humiliated. I mean, that was an outright humiliation. Um, it could have been forty to six. I mean, we left. Yeah, so it could have been. So I think. I think I'm actually expecting them to come out and if they don't beat Tampa Bay, I think it's going to be a dogfight. I don't. I don't think they're going to come out and lay an egg. I think they're going to be embarrassed. But Derek, what was your what was your takeaway, brother? We saw stuff this past weekend we hadn't seen all season. Where the hell was it? You know what I mean? Like the damn run, the the touchdown to McLaurin in the red zone was a play call that we hadn't seen all year, and it was perfection. We were one of the worst red zone offenses in the league, so we wait until the quarterback is a rookie to get you know a little exotic and make things work with some, some stuff like the where we're facing one of the best blitzing teams in, in, in the NFL and in Sam Howell, no, he didn't have hours back there, but it sure as hell felt like he was a lot more comfortable than our, our last two starting quarterbacks. Um, Chris Paul looked like the best guard we have on the roster and he was inactive for 70% of the season. It's like, I I can't explain how they can get up for this game and they can't get up for the Giants. I, I loved it. I love watching the Cowboys lose. You know, it's the second favorite thing to watching the Washington team win, and it has been for 30 years. But why does it take now when we've all been but eliminated? Why do why, why do we win the meaningless game? Why 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 do we get to dance and be happy now? Well, to be fair, we were gifted half of that team. You know what I mean? Like the offense still produced the same amount of points as it did all season long. Um, we saw some flashes and I'm sure we'll talk about how for a minute, but we saw some flashes from this team that we hadn't seen. So hopefully that's something to build on. Hopefully they see that. Um, I, I think McLaurin is McLaurin. I think Dotson is Dotson. I think it was the same team that the bounces went our way. We scored 16 offensive points we missed two field goals and an extra point um so i was happy to see it i loved it but we got the bounces this time so you know where why was this game any different than what we've seen for the last two months well a couple, a couple of things one of them being dallas played the worst game they've probably played exactly in, that i can remember and our guys for whatever reason were were up um, I know we're going to get into this, but before I forget, you you were saying those like the crossing route that they that they ran to Terry. Um, I wrote this down to talk about since I know we're going to be talking about Scott Turner too, but I'm not sure that those aren't plays that Scott has been dialing up for the last three years. But our quarterbacks, Sam Howell was did not hesitate to throw over the middle intermediate passes. He did it repeatedly. Well, in and I, I'm not sure that I'm not convinced that those plays weren't there and our other quarterbacks weren't pulling the trigger. I, I can't back that up because I haven't studied film, but it didn't, it looked like the same offense. It just looked like we had a guy who was actually cutting loose and hitting people that were running across the middle, which, which we don't do. Well, and kind of to that point, he was hitting them in stride. The reason mm -hmm. that was a touchdown is because Terry McLaurin caught the ball and in one motion was pointed towards the goalposts. He was, and he, you know gone. what I mean? Like, he wasn't reaching behind him. He wasn't reaching up over his head. No. I mean, he dropped one that would have hit him in the eyeballs had he not got his hands on it. You know what I mean? It went on the first right through his hands. It was a perfect throw. So to your point, maybe that's true. But I will tell you, I haven't I haven't spent years looking at film, but and I, I've shown it on the board. A lot of the times our crossing routes is into traffic. Like we'll have three receivers in one area. You know what I mean? Like that's that was different because there were guys actually designed running routes to clear out where Terry McLaurin was going to be, not everybody running into each other like an like a 
and I, uh, a traffic jam, hoping they bump into each other and rub the defender off. But that's just what I saw. I mean, I could be wrong. Uh, I've been saying for six months that even though Scott Turner has had a lot of issues, and we've well we've talked about that until or we're blue in the face. Part of the issue is not the play calling, but we weren't executing what was called. Like there's a lot of there's a lot of offensive coordinators that call the same kind of plays that Scott Turner calls, and the only reason people aren't flipping the hell out and calling for it their OC's heads is because the players actually execute the play. Um, so I'm just saying that is, there is a nugget of truth to that. No, that's fair. Does anyone else share my feeling on this, that I think he may be one of the most predictable play callers I, I can remember watching time after time, after time, I'm pretty sure I know what's coming and I'm way, I'm right way more often than I should be sitting on my couch, drinking bourbon and Especially since you didn't spend the week studying film. Yeah, we just, we never seem to catch anyone by surprise. Anytime that we go wide with, with our jet screens to Samuels, which worked two or three times early in the season, since then, anytime we run it, the DE on that side is charging up field and cutting him off and throwing him for a loss. This has been going on for the last eight or nine weeks, 10 weeks, I don't know. I just, I don't think that that Scott... Uh, and I'm not the first one to say this. Someone on the board wrote this that he just doesn't seem to have a a feel for the 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 run of play and getting people setting up plays and sequencing things. It just everything is so deliberate and predictable looking to me. And if if it's that to me, I suspect professional defensive coordinators are way way ahead. Well, he he can put together a drive of seven or eight amazing plays and score a touchdown, and then. You don't you have totally abandon that approach for the rest of the game. And I think Derek's done a good job of pointing that out over and over again. All right. Go ahead, Paul. We did Paul wants to Paul go for it, man. No, no, I'll go after you, Bob. Go ahead. I it's I was just I'm reminded of something I heard Gibbs say way back in the day, right? Gibbs won at one point in time. You know, so I think somebody was asking about the amount of hours he he put in, in the in the office. And his comment was something to the effect of the NFL changes every four to eight weeks. I remember this. And if you're, and if you're not changing your game plan, if you're not changing your offense to go with what the defenses are changing to counter what you've already done, you will get beat in this league. And, and so we're constantly reinventing the offense. Now, you know, those of us that watched Gibbs one know that what he really meant by that was I've got eight plays and, and I have to figure out how to run those eight plays out of different formations. And so he was constantly creating new formations and, and new cadence calls and new anything and everything to run those eight plays. Um, because the only way you can be successful in this league, if they know what's coming is if they just can't beat it, i.e. Green Bay's Packer sweep, um, you know, the Rigo drill at the end of the game, um, Joe Montana's short passing. You may know they're going to throw a slant to Jerry Rice, but God help you, you're not stopping it. You know, you, you just hope to contain it. And, and, but I don't think, is that me? Crap. No, now I'm doing it, Mark. <laughs> and my audio espn keeps popping up stuff that play and yeah that's what i was trying to do yeah I've, I've got the stats page open for the last game and now espn's running as i screw it i'll close it but it just it just feels like scott never figured out that you've got to change things and so for the last eight nine weeks we've all been able to call the plays just like the opposing defensive coordinator has been able to and the member you're looking for is Burgold. he's the one that he's the one that said he was sitting on his couch call it all the plays every time they lined up. Mark, you were talking about the predictability piece and Bob, you were hinting uh, towards it as well and what you just said uh, regarding uh, Scott Turner. I think one of the most damning pieces of evidence is when you have players from the opposing team literally coming out in the press after the game saying we knew exactly what was coming. And I believe that happened in the Cleveland game with Wentz, I forget who it was, but I think it was one of the defensive backs or safeties uh, on Cleveland who basically said, we knew exactly what was coming. And I mean, you know, again, if 
that isn't some very, very concerning evidence towards Scott Turner and some of the things he's doing, I don't know what is. I want to talk about Mr. Not Ready because Mr. Not Ready was ready. And I'll be honest with you, it, it pissed me off how ready he was because I think if we'd gone to Mr. Not Ready instead of Mr. Uh, I Lost My Retainer, um, you know, when 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 they sat Heineke down, I think we're in the playoffs right now. I know that's a lot of assumption in that, but I thought Hal looked really solid. In fact, I think Hal, he looked so solid that they should have given him 10 or 15 more pass, passing I, plays. I, I'll take it a step further than that, John. I think if we'd gone to Hal during the bye week, like Derek originally suggested, and and, and I got to be fair, I thought that was I, – I didn't – you know, I thought that was not cool. I was on the Heineke bandwagon at that point in time, but if we'd gone with Hal before the second New York game, I think we beat New York. I think the San Francisco game's a whole lot closer, and I think we beat Cleveland and Dallas, and we finish what in fifth, fourth, or fifth place. So when I said that, I want to, I do want to touch that. When I said that, I wasn't saying. I guess I was. My point simply was that neither Wentz nor Heineke had done enough to prove that they could be unbenchable mm -hmm. at that point. That what they were doing could not be replicated by almost any quarterback that is currently in the NFL, let alone a rookie on our roster. Okay, an offense, any, we were we we're in the bottom five to six of scoring every week, and we're still we were riding that hot hand coming into the so you know coming into that bye week. We had we had won what five? We went five yeah, and we had lost in six weeks or something. With five five one and one going into the bye week, right? Mm -hmm. I think we had – so we're 5-1-1 one, and one going into the bye week, and we came out averaging the exact same amount of points as we did going in, which was sub-20s. So the question had to then be asked, what can we do? Maybe how can't – you know, he's, maybe he's not ready to be uh, an elite top whatever quarterback. Even if he's not ready to be a top 15, you don't need him to be a top 15. We did not have a single – Neither one of our quarterbacks even ranked in the top 32 regarding PFF this year. So the question then has to be, be – the, the question begs, can you replicate at a minimum their production with Sam Howell? I think the answer was yes. The, because their production was still bottom five in the league. You're lo you know what I mean? We, were, we weren't winning because of Heineke and, and Wentz. We were winning – we weren't winning because of Wentz at all. We weren't winning because of Heineke. We were winning because of the defense, and we were getting enough plays, and we were getting breaks. Kendall Fuller had an interception for a touchdown against the uh, the Texans, and that the offense only scored 16 points after that moment. And that was on, what, the third play of the game? It was their first drive, right? Are you yeah. telling me that anybody should be, believe, be, be deemed as untouchable? when you're gift wrapped a touch a pick six for a touchdown in the first quarter and you can't muster more than two touch two and a half touchdowns against the worst defense in the league. That was my point that maybe it is maybe during the bye week you do go to Hal so he can have two weeks. So that at a minimum you can try to replicate what we're currently getting at worst. And if he bombs out, he bombs out. Can't be much worse than what we were getting. Two interceptions the first half by Carson Wentz. There have, there have to be reasons, and we're going to have to get into this, right, that, that we assume, I assume, sitting at home, that the professional coaches who run the team and are in practice every day and in the meeting rooms every day with the quarterbacks and the OC and everybody else have some idea about what they can expect from the guys they put in there. As you, they, you, as they I, compare I would, to each I would other. accept that if uh, they weren't responding <laughs> no, no, no. at all. Let me all finish. Let me finish the thought. Let Mark finish. You... I do want. Uh, let Mark finish. <laughs> you you would like to think. I'll say it again. You would like to think. You would like to think that the professional coaches and everybody else had a reason. And where I'm trying to drill down to is they made a decision to bench Taylor and put Carson back in, which I think. By and large, everybody agreed with at the time. I I did. I was like, okay, I mean, Taylor's not getting it done. Let's try Carson again. I'm, I'm, I'm going to own that. But I didn't have the benefit of being in practice every day and seeing what Carson was looking like. What in God's name could he have been showing in practice before the Cleveland game to justify them putting him back on the field? 
I I read somewhere just in the last well, it was after the Cleveland game. I read somewhere that Wentz looks brilliant in practice. He's hitting guys in stride. He was making all the right reads. He was, but and and that and that that was pretty much the same in late training camp and the early part of the year too. That he looked brilliant in practice. But once you put him on the field where he didn't have the protection of that that red jersey anymore, he became a different guy. And, He's got and, an anxiety disorder, man. I'm, under, I, I'm telling you right now, all you have to do is watch him walk onto the game, onto the field at the start of that game. He looks like he wants to be in Florida. He looks like he wants to be anywhere other than on that field. It's written all over his face and all over his body language, man. And mm-hmm. I don't know how they cannot – how can you not? I mean, that was hit. That was kind of what we heard about him, right? Is uh, his Indian name is Folds Under Pressure? That's what we heard from Andy <laughs> fans, from coaching. Jesus, I gotta write these down. Go to a gunfight with a I don't know. I, I just think, and you're right. We did. We were calling for Wentz, but I think that was only because it that it wasn't on the table. We knew. Well, that I think uh, Riverboat Ron. Point- a riverboat Ron, you know, he's not going to take chances. The like reason that. I said Wentz is because I, to that point, Heineke had not done anything that made me to believe he was untouchable. And it's the same logic I had with how Heineke had not done anything to that point to make me believe he was untouchable. Yeah. That but, doesn't mean uh, that uh, maybe he would have won a game or two more, but he wasn't untouchable. He had not done enough to prove that you could not bench him. So I know it's we're past Cleveland and all that, but do we then think that there was something other than than football assessment? Ron has to know that Carson's got performance anxiety too when he goes on the field. He's been around it more than we have. Did he did he play Carson more about about other factors, owner factors, salvaging his reputation, salvaging his reputation, something other than football? In which case, that's pretty damning. and it might be just look, there. Maybe they were just trying to make sure that it wasn't going to click with Wentz. Well, guess what? You cost well, yourself did. the damn season proving that it wasn't going to click with Wentz. We all have seen it for a long time. What's and, most damning is that we saw him imploding and they did nothing. Yeah. They literally that. Yeah, that yeah was, exactly. That was I a can, fireable offense. You're, you're in the hunt for the playoffs. Of course, he didn't know that. But you're in the hunt for the, a playoff spot and your quarterback literally – imploding he has one good drive and then you that's that keeps him in for the whole rest of the game meanwhile our season swirls down the toilet i mean i just can't i could not believe that he didn't make a change make do something for god's sake yeah (laughs) yeah and i think that's the point john you know he carson did enough at the end of the san francisco game to warrant them being a little optimistic i can see that but man by the by the end of the first drive of the third quarter against Cleveland, I think it was pretty obvious. I wasn't even watching the game. It's obvious to me looking at the stats and listening to you guys in chat that Carson was done at that point in time. I'm, I'm I, I will yeah. almost be shocked if Carson is on a roster next year in any capacity. My biggest fear is that the group that is evaluating the quarterbacks including going into next year and what moves they may deem necessary for next year is the same group that thought Ryan Fitzpatrick may be an answer. Carson Wentz may be an answer. Uh, God, I love Taylor Heineke, but he was a kid, what, you know, the famous story, sleeping on his sister's couch out of the game of football, signed only to be a COVID emergency quarterback in case all hell breaks loose. And he's the best guy the last two years, uh, consistently at that position, um, which is kind of lucky. Um, Hal's not ready. Maybe he's not. Looks a lot more ready than I was led to believe by the coaching staff. Um, these guys are going to do it again. Bring the band back together and make another decision in uh, the next couple months. Kind of looking at me right? that scares me to death. And I'm not even sure that Wentz is coming back is off the table. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but when they were asked when Mayhew in that fumbling, bumbling, I don't even know why they held it. Well, I know why, because they had to mandates it. But that press conference, end of season press conference, when they were asked about Wentz, 
they basically what they said was, well, it was because of Brian Robinson being hurt. That's why Wentz looked so bad because we couldn't, you know, run it two to one ratio or whatever nonsense they were spewing. But that that really frightens me because that. And maybe maybe they just don't, you know, maybe they're just being decent people and not wanting to throw uh, Carson Wentz under the bus any more than he already has been thrown. But I'm telling you, man, I'm I'm so frightened of Ron Rivera at this point that I, I wouldn't put anything past him. Brian Robinson didn't play on Sunday. I, I don't <clears> – <throat> I haven't seen this written anywhere, and I don't understand why I haven't seen it written anywhere. Jonathan Williams has looked brilliant every single time we put him in the game. He's got – the size and the beef to be Brian Robinson, except that he's been in the league eight, nine years. There's absolutely no reason that they could not have used Jonathan Williams in the first four games, the way they wanted to use Brian Robinson and been just fine. And it, so don't tell me that it was the fact that Brian Robinson got shot. You got another running back, put the other running back in there and use the same damn game plan. The and you got does- Antonio Gibson. If you, if you'd stop using them as a wide receiver, You've, he's a hell of a running back in his own right. You know, you split the carries between Gibson and, and, and Williams and run the same damn game plan. Don't make excuses. I'm tired of excuses. And I'm, I'm getting a little tired of media that accepts Ron's excuses. Granted, you know, Mark, John, you guys may have a different perspective because you've kind of been in the room a little bit. I never covered a game for, for the other site. Um, so I, I have no clue what goes on. I'm sure that there's a little bit of the old, you know, you've, you've got to, you've got to go along to get along kind of a thing. And, and, you know, if the, if the guys want to continue to be on the inside, they can't just positively roast the coach, um, well, especially if they know right he's now. coming back next year. Right. And, and I think at this point in time, smart bets are that Rivera's back next year for no other reason than simply because, well, how, how do you, you know, you keep what I honestly, I was shocked. They fired Turner to be honest with you. Um, just because of the the ownership situation. So, Bob, I'll tell you right now. Locally, they're not packing any punches at this point. There, co- there's there's a handful of reporters that are coming. Honest. Um, they may they're and, coming honest in the papers, Derek, but I don't hear no, them at the coming press honest in the press conference. At the I'd be looking at coach and going, I, I don't know. That sounds like an excuse to me, coach. You had J- you had Williams, you had Gibson. Why didn't you run them? Hold on, hold on. Now, Kiffy Finley mentioned something today that uh, kind of relates. He said pre-COVID, <clears throat> the rules in the press conferences were totally different. Uh, he goes, since COVID and, and continuing into now, each reporter is only allowed two questions. <clears throat> um, and then your time's up and the microphone is passed. He said in the past, he goes, generally the press conferences start out a little softer and then you kind of build into it and then you can ask a question and then continue to follow up if uh, you know go dig a little deeper etc because you can't anymore you get two questions and off it goes and uh, and it depends on where you are in the room because if you're one of the first people to ask no one's going to come right out as the first question and go you stink <laughs> don't you think this is your fault um that sort of thing and it just kind of changes yeah. the whole dynamic of the press conference I can They've see gotten something. a little tougher as the years gone on, though. They did. Yeah. I, I, don't know, I want to say it was Ben Standig, but somebody asked, um, and Scott, is it Scott Abra- Abramson? It asked Gabriel, Abraham. Scott Abraham. But I know one of them asked him, like, okay, this is year three. You've yet to have a winning season. You told us, like, three years ago <laughs> what you expected, and it doesn't, you know, to most observers, it doesn't look like we've really – improved to any great degree and he, he he didn't really answer the question but I mean at least I thought that was a fairly fairly aggressive question at least made him try to answer it so he finally gave a little bit of an answer yesterday by firing Scott Turner and I'll agree that 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 surprised me a bit too I'm I'm, I'm glad because I think it's been pretty obvious for a while that that's not working so well uh, maybe that's his answer right there. We fielded a good defense this year, except for the first couple of games, good enough to be a playoff team. Um, we faced a relatively weak schedule, and we didn't face a bunch of uh, elite quarterbacks this year, and we still managed eight wins, one of them that didn't really mean anything at the end of the season. So 
this was the first time that I really thought that it went sideways. The year one was year one and he, and he backed into a playoff spot. Okay. That was fun. Year two it was just fucking bizarre with, with the COVID and all the injuries at the end. And it wasn't surprising to me that we collapsed at the end this year, going into those two giants game and Browns was the first time I really sort of saw it go sideways. So he's got, if he's coming back next year, He's got some real work to do. He's going to have to bring in a proven OC, I, I guess, right? Somebody that, that's that got some gravitas and can be the Jack Del Rio on the other side. Because it's going to be it's going to be tough for him to have another season where we're at midseason talking about averaging 17 points a game. That was an excuse a thon, man. That pressure, that was like, I felt like from the minute they started talking, he, he and Mayhew, it was like, we know that we might get fired and we better – say everything we can to make sure no one thinks that any of this is our fault. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was excuse after excuse after excuse. And to me, that's not, that's not really leadership, man. That's not Gibbs. That's for damn sure. Gibbs, if Gibbs had a season like that, all you'd hear about is we have to coach better, stop the buck stops here. Um, you would never hear him say injuries and, uh, you know, just the nonsense that Ron spews about why, why we're, it takes us six games to start playing football and why we can't win the big games and some of his coaching decisions. So he's, I'm off the Rivera bus. If you guys haven't picked up on that, I'm just letting you well, know. The other, the other thing is we try, we gave them a ton of credit that, that, that like tight lipped, you don't hear anything negative coming out of Ashburn, you know, nobody start. Well, in the last couple of weeks, there's been a lot <clears> of reports, you know what I mean? There's been a lot of, 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 of civil unrest in the, in the, in the, in that locker room that we hadn't heard of before this. And I think that's what ended up getting Scott Turner fired, to be honest with you. But to that point, Ron, you've talked about culture. You've changed the culture. Well, it looks like it's changing back. You know what I mean? We're getting leaks again. We're getting frustrated players. We're getting, we're, we're getting anonymous sources talking about how poorly the team's being run. So I don't know. I, he might be losing that locker room, to be honest with you. So I know I thought, we still want to talk about about Sam Howell, but I, I I thought earlier today, if I'm Ron Rivera at the end of that game, I've just watched this young rookie quarterback look like he has a chance to be a starting quarterback in the NFL. I mean, it, there's reason to be optimistic there. I can see him having decided, yeah, I think I'd like to coach still. I, I'm not ready to retire. I'd like to come back. And when they get a new owner, I'm going to sell it this way. <laughs> I'm going to sit down and say, here's the litany of problems that I've been dealing with for the last three years with new ownership in here. I'm not going to have anybody telling me that I'm inheriting Dwayne Haskins and he's going to have to play. I am not having somebody looking over my shoulder and saying, you're going to bring in Carson Wentz. I know I took the heat for it, but yeah, Dan told me I had to hire him. Um, I've got a young quarterback I think can play. I've got a defense that's playoff ready. Give me a year and let's get this thing going. Um, I'd like to think that's what he's going to sit down and tell the new owner. Because I think he's going to be here either way. I'm worried that he's going to, that his goal is going to be, is not going to be focused on like grooming a young quarterback. I think most fans would like us to give Hal a chance, give him a year see and see what he can do. If you want to bring in a veteran, fine, a, you know, a, a lower tiered veteran or draft a guy. But I just, I worry, and this is why, it's not that I didn't want to see Scott Turner get fired, but I don't, I'm not a fan of, of Ron Rivera, who's dead coach walking, I think. I, I'm not a fan of him making big decisions that are going to impact this franchise beyond, you know, for, for conceivably for seasons to come. Yes, and so I worry about him making decisions like I'm going to bring Jimmy Garoppolo in, or I'm going to, I'm going to trade picks for Derek Carr or whatever. I don't know. I don't even know if it would entail picks, but I worry about him doing another Wentz maneuver and just to try to get to a winning season before his, the conversation really happens about, are you coming back in 2024? It just seems like that's what it, that's probably what's in his mind. I don't think it's let me find the quarterback of the future for the Washington Commanders and and start a rookie or a second year uh, guy who's ha had one game and take our lumps as he learns. Well, you know, you look at the NFL and and 
there aren't very many guys out there that are worried about that unless they're thinking they're going to be the guy long term. The NFL is a what have you done for me lately league. You know, and you've got teams all over the place. You, you, you know, you look, Sean McVay is, the, the talk is that Sean McVay is going to walk away from the LA Rams because he's burned out. Well, how much of burned out do you think has to do with the fact that they have almost nothing left in draft capital? Yeah. They've got, their their superstars are aging out. He's looking at a, almost a complete rebuild without any tools in the shed to rebuild. He won his Super Bowl. He's 36. He wants to spend some time with his family. He knows how much time is going to go into this. You know, and and teams do this all over the league. You know, they, they how many times do we watch a team trade something stupid? How many times has Andy Reid fleeced somebody over a wide receiver or a quarterback? Granted, Tariq Hill still got plenty left in the tank after going to Miami, but crap, he traded quarterbacks to us twice who shouldn't have been playing anymore. Yeah, but we gave him draft stock. <clears throat> Kansas City don't look like they're missing Tyreek Hill either, do they? No, they don't. But that's my point is, you know, there, there are a very few teams in the, but Andy Reed's not coaching on a clock right now either. Nobody's talking about Andy Reed being done at the end of next year, done at the end of the year after that. Nobody's talking about Kansas city changing hands. That's a well-run organization and they are, they are in sustain success mode, much like we saw with the Patriots for nearly two decades. Right. Common denominator, quarterback, a great quarterback. There's two, well, and it's great a, coach. Common denominator, great quarterback, but also a, also a, a solid, stable coach. You know, there've been some. There've been some. Look at. You can argue Aaron Rodgers is one of the be, is one of one of what the best three four quarterbacks to play in the National Football League in the last twenty years, and Green Bay fired their coach today. Yeah, I think Aaron Rodgers says, you have a choice to make. Well, and that may be part of it too, right? You know, there may be politics and Aaron may pull more strings there than maybe players should. Um, but, you know, when you've got a great quarterback, you know, and I just, I, I look at, I look at Washington and, and I look at Ron Rivera and John, you're absolutely right. I have the same fears. I'm worried that Rivera wants to, even if he's, even if he has decided he doesn't want to coach past next year, he also doesn't want to leave having coached pure 500 ball at in Washington. And let's face it right this minute. I think if we looked at his record, it is almost exactly 500. Um, what seven and nine is first year to like two games under, right. Or one game under. Yeah. I mean, he may not even be at 500. And, and so I can totally see him doing something stupid for one year that impacts this team for he's, the next three or four. He's actually, like five, he was seven and nine, seven and ten, eight, eight and one. All right, so he's four games under five hundred, and somehow he went five hundred in a season that's got an odd number of games. That's like a you know an amazing accomplishment. And we have the sixteenth pick out of thirty-two. We are an average football team, my friends. We are completely well, an average football team, and I can see him making the you know not wanting to ride with a rookie, and and he wants it. Bring in a conservative offensive coordinator that he thinks will get him 10 wins with a conservative game managing quarterback who can do something with the talent we've got. We get to 10 wins, lose in the first round next year, and Rivera rides off with his five or six million and into retirement. Well, here's here's the scary thing to think about. And maybe this is the eternal optimist that I even opened my eyes to this. This team averages five more points a game in their top 15, and we likely win 11 games. You can easily have the conversation, okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. Even if you don't want to say, okay, well, that's just a hypothetical. He said, we, I, I bet you the six of us could come up where we left at least five points on the field for every loss we had this year, okay? And the one of them, we lost that, we left at least eight points on the field. Uh, and this past game, we left seven points on the field that we know about, okay? So I actually don't, I don't want Rivera to make the long-term decision to quarterback either because I don't think he should be. Well, he might do it. I don't want him to do it because I don't want to give up something that's going to affect this team beyond when he's here. But I also don't know that he has to. Um, we all have been frustrated with the quarterback play and we all have been frustrated with the offensive coordinator. The two biggest pieces of the offense, as bad as they have been. so. Can we find 
five points a game between a, a new offensive coordinator and potentially a new quarterback or how. That's going to be the who question. doesn't miss extra points and, and feel. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, that's, our point. that's true. At least six, right? That is, that's, that is absolutely true. You know, we can find five points in the Tennessee game. We had the ball first and goal from the two with 37 seconds on the clock. Right. We know we can find five points in the Giants game that we lost because we got hosed on a play on a bad penalty in the end zone or non call in the end zone as time was winding down. That's, I mean, we, I, we know we can find it in the Minnesota game. Did they not score real, real late in that game? It was a one score game, correct? Mm hmm. I mean, we're talking, I know it's all hypotheticals, but that's, I think that's where we kind of need to scale back and take an look, honest look at the offense. I, so I don't want Rivera to spend a ton of money and draft pack capital and commit a long-term quarterback because all we're going to do then is change the entire dynamic of the rest of the 53. So we're not finding our franchise guy walking the street. Well, the other, the other thing I just want to bring up is they, they apparently, it's been reported, and I think it's been verified, that Rivera fully intended to draft Sam Howe in the second or third round if – or it, they had him rated that high. If we didn't get a quarterback before that, right. yeah. So when they, got Wentz, when they got Wentz, that kind of changed things, and, of course, he dropped. But my thing is, okay, if you had him rated as a second or third rounder, and the first time you put him out there, he looks like – you know, he looks pretty damn good. Why in God's name would you not – go forward with, with that young quarterback right, so and I, you know, he hasn't said he's not so to be fair but i'm not hearing a lot of i mean i don't know he just seems i mean he just seems reluctant to take any kind of risk at all at that position so leave everything exactly the same and just change the head coach what's the answer to the question he was is sam he was asked in the in the press conference is sam howell going to be you know the starter next year and and I think he played it off, right? He he kind of deflected the question, and he didn't say no, but he but he also didn't commit. Change the guy sitting behind the table. That's Sean McVay. That's Kyle Shanahan. That's Andy Reid. That's any number of other guys that are playing in the playoffs this year. How does the answer to that question change? Do you think? I think it's I think it's kind of he's in a tough spot with the quarterback. The, the take away all the ownership problem potential and that right now there's it's a rudderless ship, right? He's he's the man until we hear otherwise from either from Snyder or from whoever the new owner is going to be. But heading into next season, as of today, I'm penciling in Sam Howell. If I'm if I'm Rivera, I'm penciling in Sam Howell as my starter until and unless I get a better option that comes comes across my desk. If, if Lamar Jackson hits his head and wakes up and decides he wants to volunteer to come play in Washington for vet minimum and, and incentives and prove it for the next two years, yeah, I'm signing him up. If some, I don't know, if something, what I'm just suggesting is you keep your options open, but right now I'm, I'm heading into next season with Sam Howell as my, as my presumed starter and I'm trying hard to re-sign Taylor to be the, the number two if he'll have it. If not, I'm going to go out and find an inexpensive veteran backup. Colt McCoy is still alive, right? I think he's still alive. He is. Somebody to back Colt, up. Sam Colt Hall McCoy started games for Arizona this year. He, caught, he won games <laughs> for Arizona yeah. this year. He's, he's Taylor Heineke. I, I, want to bring, I want to bring up my my what I still believe and I've been pounding on for a while now, the cardinal sin of the entire season. And I, I think it matters more than whether it was Carson Wentz or Taylor Heineke, a quarterback. I think it matters more than Scott Turner calling plays. I think it was a capital crime to roll out that piece of shit offensive line and then try to run an offense through it. I nice. think that's malfeasance. Fair. Um, even the two best guys, probably the guys that played the best, Leno and um, – the other tackle, Lucas Elton. Cosme. No, uh, Lucas. Lucas, Lucas Cosme okay. missed some games. They're they're nothing special. They're they're old and they're at the end of the line and they're um, you know Leno particularly seemed to wear down throughout the season this year, even though he played every snap. Um, 
just nothing. How do you, how do you want to run the offense you want to run, bring in a quarterback that's not mobile, and not have anybody in front of them? I, I that, Chris, that, that goes totally back to, to managing the salary cap. That was all of that was a, was a knee jerk response to suddenly having $28 million disappear from your salary cap because you had to pay Carson once. I think the offensive line would have looked very different this year. If, if we had gone into the draft looking for our quarterback and picking up Sam Howell and we didn't have Wentz, I think, I think you'd see a very different offensive line. He, and even if you Ron have Rivera is not a GM guys, that's what, that's what we're, yeah. we're dancing around it. That's the problem. He's not a GM. He's never going to be a gym. He, he can't see the big picture. He, he doesn't have that skill set. And because if he had, you know, we, I mean, look at, look, <laughs> even the things he's saying don't make sense. We want it to be a run first off. And that's a bunch of bullshit. Th that's just plain and utter crap. Uh, two, we to want one, two, run first. Two, two to one, two to one, one running offense. Meanwhile, you hire yeah, a meanwhile, play action <laughs> quarterback um, who can't run at all. And you let your O-line deteriorate to being almost. Well, and then you, and then you call first. the plays that you call. You run 80% of your plays out of, well, what it feels like, 80% of your plays out of your shotgun. Either you're going to be a bully or you're not. Are you going to be, you can't be a two-to-one outside zone run offense out of shotgun. You're just never going to win that battle. Linebackers are way too fast. Defensive tackles are way too strong. And defense corners are way too smart. If you're going to try to even be a bully, you can't do it in the modern, out of the modern sets, which is part of the frustration. And I, I keep coming back to that stupid play call in Cleveland. When yeah, we the pitched pitch. the damn ball yeah. seven yards behind the line of scrimmage to our fourth string running back behind that offensive line. It was unfair. You can never win that way. And yeah, that's just not the way that you're going to win football games. Playing, playing, you know, you might as well just, just start researching Army's offense and figuring, hey, if we can just limit them and maybe put up 12 points, maybe we'll just drain enough time off the clock. We led the league in time of possession, led the league in time of possession. We had a bottom third of the league in every other statistical category. How do you do that? By just because you possess the ball more than anybody else, you should at least be better than half the teams in the league. Well, that was, John Time was talking about that today. He said Rivera was harping has been harping on that they want to run a ball control offense it's like we and i posted on twitter we did run a ball control offense we <laughs> led the league in ball in control, time, of possession. time of possession it doesn't matter points points win games well we had the worst if not the worst one of the worst red zone offenses in, in football i mean that that's where you win yes. games that's where you win games so i'm i'm more mad at Ron now that he waited until the day after the season to fire Scott Turner because he clearly had his same frustrations with Scott that we do and saw some of the same issues. He's been hinting at it the whole second half of the season. You know, a, a guy who was really, really wanting to push and make the playoffs might have pulled the trigger sooner than that. Or at least at least put the the fear of God into Scott that, look, we're doing the this week, we're doing the game plan together. <laughs> And this is what I want to see. Or, and he never or did that. you're not calling the plays this week. How about that? We signed him to a three-year extension in January. Yeah, that, that's pretty irritating. That's, that's the part I don't understand. We knew who he was. You know, uh, Dennis Green. We knew who they were, right? He's, he, we've <laughs> got were, all this know. tape on Scott Turner. We know what he wants to do. The dude wants to pass the football. Doesn't By the way, the other team knows what he wants to do, too. Sorry. Exactly. The other team knows what he wants to do, too. We know what he wants to do. We know when we looked best last year, and it was when Scott Turner went counter to his nature with about, what, four games, five games? Paul can tell me off the top of his head which five games it was. I know Tampa Bay was in there. But, you know, Antonio Gibson had a four-game stretch of his life. Any running back in the league would have loved those four games. And then we reverted to form, or I should I say Scott Turner reverted to form, and we started losing again. Granted, a lot of injuries, COVID problems, all kinds of shit at the end of the season to deal with. And, and I understand all of that. But you don't 
do that, get to the end of the season thinking we want to be a ball control offense next year and give an offensive coordinator who doesn't appear to know how to consistently run a ball control offense a three-year extension. I, I, it's bad business. So, Paul, what do you think, man? You've, you've, you've been, I can see, I can see the wheels, the gears turning. Yeah, I, I was going to piggyback off something you said, Mark, um, in regards to, you know, why didn't Rivera pull the trigger earlier and possibly make the move to uh, relieve Turner of his duties earlier in the season? It plays into the idea and the fact that Ron Rivera has been a guy who has played it safe all season. He's played it safe on the field. I go back to the Giants game. We punt from their 34-yard line on our opening drive. Uh, John mentioned it. He doesn't pull Carson Wentz in the Cleveland game. I would even take it one step further and say in that first Giants game, at the end of the game when you uh, have that touchdown to Dotson, why don't you go for two and try to get the win at that point? He has played it safe with his on-field decisions. He has played it safe in his personnel and coaching decisions as well. You could argue that he could have went to Sam Howell potentially after the Chicago game. We're sitting at what, two and four at that point? Is there any harm in going to Sam Howell at that point? If he fizzles out, worst case scenario, you have a pretty high draft pick going into year four of Ron Rivera. Um, Bob mentioned the idea of Jonathan Williams. Are you telling me he, he could not have produced early in the season in the absence of Brian Robinson? Ron Rivera has played it safe. Uh, the entire season, and I think it's ultimately been him in the rear end, and that's why you're essentially eight, eight, and one at the end of the season. Go big or go home. I don't quite see how he fits that Riverboat Ron moniker uh, whatsoever here in Washington. I think if there is a little bit more of a gamble and a willingness to take some risks, I think we would reap uh, some pretty decent rewards from that. I mean, what's the guy fearing that he's going to lose? If there's anybody in this league that as a fan base that knows how to lose and knows the feeling of losing, it's us. I'm completely numb to it after 30 plus years. You, 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 you know, nothing worse can happen. You lose a football game. Great. We've been doing it for 34 years. Right. Um, you, you have to be willing to take some risks. And he's certainly not a risk taker. And I don't think that's going to, I don't think that cat is going to change its, its stripes, right? Heading into next year. He's still going to be the same guy. Mark, I mean, go ahead, Derek. Here's the other thing that just drives me bonkers with it. You, we want to run a ball controlled offense. I'm literally going through all 22 right now while we're talking because I wanted to take a look at that Terry play, see if we run the same concepts with um, Wentz and Heineke, and maybe we're just not executing or whatever every freaking drive every series every third play is empty backfield five wide receivers spread offense so how can you tell me to my face that you're purple but you're walking down the street and you're green you know what i'm saying like you can't tell me you're a run ball controlled offense I'm watching the most important game of the year right now against the Giants. Every drive, there's multiple plays. You're running empty backfield with Taylor Heineke, five wide receivers, nobody in to help block after they had been abusing you. And that's with a healthy Robinson. Right. Where is your ball control offense? You know what I mean? Like it goes back. I, this is why I can't put it all on the quarterback. Okay. This is why. Yes, the quarterback can be bad. The quarterback play can be bad. I see people all over Twitter. How can you give how can you truly judge Scott Turner with how bad the quarterbacks have been? But look, the quarterbacks can be bad. The offensive coordinator can be bad. They both can be true at the same time. And they were. Okay. Yeah. Right. That's a fair assessment. Here's my point. The quarterback is the guy who touches the ball every play. It's the offensive coordinator's job to get the most out of that guy. So eventually, when you hit eight quarterbacks under you, you're statistically identical across all eight quarterbacks. 
points per game has gone down a point per game every year Scott Turner has been ROC. If you go back to Carolina, the year when he was in the, the in his averages, when he was the offensive coordinator calling plays in the second half of that season, they were averaging 18 and a half points a game. You're sub 20. Okay. We're not talking about for four games while they were a lame duck. You were the guy for 50 games in your sub 20 on average points per game. It's not just the guy under center anymore. Okay. You have to make him better. He can't always make you better. To John's point on the board, yes, a, an elite quarterback could mask a lot of the deficiencies from the offensive coordinator. That's I'm not beyond that. But guess what? There aren't elite quarterbacks walking the street, okay? You got to make your team better. Mark, you said the most important thing to those three teams was those three – two guys we were talking about earlier was quarterback. One guy has Mahomes. The other guy has Brady. Well, Washington drafts Mahomes or Brady. Do they turn into Brady? I guarantee you if we had drafted Brady, we don't have seven rings, bro. Like, I hate to be that way. I promise you, we don't have seven rings. Well, Brady also happened to have one of the best coaches of the last generation. Exactly. Uh, so, I mean, so, that, so, that's fair. Okay. Franchise elite quarterbacks are not walking the street. You got to – you have to develop them. You have to put guys in position to succeed. We can't keep asking these guys to keep running into a wall, hoping at some point we finally knock it down. Let's figure out another way to win. So should we talk about what we're doing going forward? If this is a good segue to me, we have a new OC. Let, let's assume that Ron Rivera is hiring the next OC. Let's just assume that. One, how different does it look with, and, and what do we expect he might do? And two, do we think that there might be a quarterback here for that new OC to, to use in Sam Howell? I'm going to thoughts on it, but I'm not going to start. I'm not going to answer that question. I'm going to let you guys tackle that one, but I did want to just bring up, circle back around to something that relates to this conversation, which Mark brought up about Wentz, that the, surely the coaching staff sees something that Wentz is doing in practice, was doing in practice, that led them to believe that he could get the job done and was a better alternative to Heineke, et cetera. But my question is, how can they not have seen that Sam Howell is more athletic than any quarterback on the roster, has a better arm than any quarterback on the roster, makes at least as good, probably better decisions. <laughs> and I know it's a small sample size. I get it. We can say that every 30 seconds if we need to, to, to keep it uh, real, but how how did was anyone even looking at the kid? Because it Not took about, it took about four plays in that Dallas game to to know to see that the arm. He was a better alternative. Oh, so, but and John, that to your point to circle to to tie a nice little nice little bow on this thing is that's why I don't want them making the decision because I don't trust them. Right, I don't want them looking and evaluating quarterback to bring in here to be a long term answer because I don't trust them. So, Mark, to, make, to to now segue it into your question, I hope they don't do anything. And the reason I hope they don't do anything is because chances are the offensive coordinator is not going to be here in two years anyway. Ron Rivera is not going to be here in a year anyway. As uh, that's fair, that but sitting here, sitting here tonight, the best information we have is that Ron Rivera is likely to be here and making that decision. I know. So, you know what I hope he does? I hope he hitches his, hitches his wagon to Sam Howell dedicates it to Sam Howell. The offensive coordinator comes in and builds an offense around Sam Howell to make that, because I think Sam Howell can be at minimum what we've seen for the last three years. I agree at a that. minimum. If nothing, he can be better as the season progresses. And then you go into 24 and you really start to evaluate where the direction of the team is going. With, with the people that are the future, not Ron Rivera making the decision. Correct. Yeah. So, so do we think Ron's OC hire, will he try to be true to what he's saying about, I want to be a, a smash mouth two to one run pass team and hire an OC with that in mind? Or does he go out and invite a bunch of candidates in and say, sell me, tell me why you want to come here. I hope he team. does the latter. He needs to bring as many people in and say, you look at my roster and tell me what you're going to do with it. And you tell me you're how you're going to find me seven points a game. You find me seven points a game, we're winning 14 games. 
first. I don't think there's an OC out there that would sign up for. Uh, I want you to run a two to one ratio. I mean, that's insanity. No, I no, because consider we. Think... Sorry, not to, to completely no. hog this podcast. John, didn't you post something not that long ago about how Scott Turner runs more than anybody in the league, and it was like forty-one percent? Yeah, I mean, he was in the right in the middle of the league in terms of rushing attempts. There, but what was the percentage? Aren't, there aren't any OCs well, like forty percent running two to one. There aren't any offenses doing two to one. There, there aren't any, any offenses sure doing there one, might be one to one, one right now. The Titans might run like 50-50, but it's. Well, you know who has run heavy end of the year stats are teams that have big leads in the first half. And yeah. run it all in the second half that's to right. run out the clock. And they used, that, and, and, that's because they scored 35 points in the first half throwing the ball. Right. I, ten so, of the ten of the eleven top passing game uh, teams in the league are in the playoffs. Yeah, that's all you need to know. Yeah. So I saw that stat today. Ten of eleven of the top passing leagues or top passing teams are in the playoffs. There that's you go. Was, I want to go back to to Mark's comment question topic from just a second ago sam howell offensive coordinator i pulled up some numbers because i was curious and i and i see some similarities one and oh as a starter 22 of 35 for 62.9 percent completion rate zero touchdowns one interception two sacks those are patrick mahomes rookie numbers after Patrick Mahomes' rookie season, Andy Reid traded his starting quarterback to Washington. And coming off his best season. Coming off, like yes. Years. You can argue Alex Smith was coming off his best season in years. He traded his starting quarterback to Washington and named Patrick Mahomes the starting QB in Kansas City, and the Chiefs haven't looked back. I am not saying that Sam Howell is Pat Mahomes, all right? But I'm saying he did enough to warrant – the coach sitting down at the end of your press conference and saying, we think the guy going forward is Sam Howell. We may be wrong, but we're going to give that a shot in training camp. Well, and to take that a step further, what can I do to make him successful? Where can I build the offense around his ability? Because the offense that Kansas City's running with Mahomes ain't the offense that they were running with Alex Smith, I promise. So, But there's still elements of that, Derek. I agree. You know, I agree. If we have a new owner in March. Does he sit down, Ron, down and say, I want you to develop, you know, while we're trying to figure out what we're going to do in a year, I want to see what he can do. Dear God, I hope not. I hope he hires the best GM in the history of the league who sits Ron down and says, you're playing Sam Howell this year because we've got to figure out what we've got in this guy. That's what I hope happens. I hope the, the new owner goes, I'm hiring football people, and then I'm going to Bermuda. If I'll it happens, but I don't know if that's going to happen in 2023, Bob. I don't know if there'll be any changes in 2023. I think there'll be some front office changes, John. I'll, I will be absolutely stunned if the new owner does not come in and make changes in the front office. There may be no on-field changes because it's too late. But if I'm the new owner, I absolutely want to do something different Maybe I leave these guys in place until after the draft because they've done all their homework. But I absolutely have my own guy at least waiting in the wings. Yeah, if I'm the new owner, I've already made that decision before I I sign the paper. I've got my guy. That's that's where I was going, Mark. If if I'm bidding on this, I have football guys on my Hmm. on my team already. I have already interviewed some of those guys. I have advisors. Maybe they aren't the guys that I hire but they're the guys that help me figure out who I'm hiring. Absolutely. You know, th- these guys didn't get to be billionaires in a vacuum and not, a, they, they're all arrogance SOBs, but they all know their limitations. Well, Dan they also, they wasn't a billionaire when he bought this team and he did it by the skin of his teeth and he didn't understand his limitations. 20 years has taught him something. Well, his original group remember that wasn't it Milstein. Was that the name of the guy? who yeah. actually was the grown up in the room and did have some con- some contacts and I suspect would have been a whole lot better owner. He that backed was- out and Dan won it anyway. Did he get backed out or did the NFL reject him? That I don't remember. I just remember I that. The, he- I think the NFL rejected Dan was going to be a minority part of that group. He probably right? found a horse head in his bed, man. <laughs> it was a Dan Snyder. Or a gallon of vanilla ice. <laughs> <laughs> 
John with your vanilla ice cream lines all over the internet for the last three days. And hilariously, I have to explain it to the you know millennials that are responding to me. What are you talking about? They don't know. They don't know, man. I wonder if Joe Barry got a got vanilla ice cream in in Green Bay today. <laughs> Yeah, they're dropping like they're dropping out there, right? We got several coaches out of work. So no, I had this, heard LaFleur, LaFleur got canned yeah, today. Today. I did not that. Yeah, he never looked right to me on the field anyway. And something about that guy it just didn't didn't set right. Well, he I'm I think, circle I, back I, to what I, Chris has said. If we don't, I don't care who's the quarterback or anything else next year, if we don't make some a concerted effort to field a professional offensive line next year. I'm going to really wonder what the hell we're doing because that was a mess. This was a pretty decent run blocking team, but teams eventually figured out, you know, if we put 11 guys in the line, we're probably going to slow down the run. And it was just the, so one of the worst pass blocking offensive lines. I think I can remember ever. Assuming they decide that how, you know, how and, I don't know how and Heineke are going to fight it out in training camp. <clears throat> we and assuming we get a third round compensatory pick for sure. Who do you think, Paul? Do you think Heineke's back next year? This no, year? I don't. No, no, I don't. Um, I, I I've had that sense that I don't. He, he can. He might be talking a good game and saying the night and saying the right things in the media, but behind the scenes, I think it's really, really eating him, eating at him that he didn't get to play in that Cleveland game. And then they turned around the following week and said, you're starting against Dallas. Um, to, to me, that's a slap in the face. Um, you know, and it, qu quite honestly, over the last two years, Taylor Heineke has probably been one of the biggest contributors, contributors towards making our seasons somewhat relevant. Um, you know, his, some of his play and some of the energy that he that he infused into that team uh, were, were some of the large reasons why we were fighting for a playoff spot um, in the season. I, I would hate to see what our seasons may have become, um, you know, had had we not had his contributions. But I, I definitely don't think he is coming back whatsoever. Yeah, I agree with that. He never was an underperformer. That's what I always say about Heineke. He, he's one of the players that can say that. I mean, he is, it wasn't always good enough, but it was never, it was never like a lack of effort or he put it all out there every time. Tell you what, if he does come back, I suspect it's because he doesn't get any good offers out there. Right. I think he's going to get decent offers and he's going to take them. I think he should. I think he's coming back. Do you? I think he understands who he is. You know, um, isn't I Scott Turner? His... Gives him, I think if someone gives him $5 million worth of reasons uh, <clears throat> and be able to be in a city that loves him, surrounded by teammates and uh, that loves him and the relationships that he's built uh, within that locker room and, and love that he's earned from the community, um, I think he comes back. Do you guys hear Logan well, Thomas talking about him? To get this, he's not going to get the opportunity to be the starter anywhere. He's yeah, not going to be a backup. So. He's going to be on a team full of guys he doesn't know in a city he doesn't know with fans that don't know him. Um, sometimes I think it's there's more to it, especially at, at that level. Um, I think he comes back. I think it would help Howell a lot because we're looking at a situation where Howell might be the only. He loves Howell. Guy coming back. I think he loves Howell. They seem to like. They seem to be have a good yeah. relationship. Honestly, it feels like the whole quarterback room gets along really, really well. Yeah. I mean, I don't. I don't think any of those guys dislike anybody. I don't think there's any bad blood in there. Mm -hmm. I think if there's any bad blood, it's outside the room, and they're not thrilled about the way necessarily they, you know, potentially been treated. But mm -hmm. I'm. I'm. If Turner had stayed, I would totally be in Chris's camp and say he's coming back. With Turner leaving. He was Heineke's biggest proponent, although, you know, we've yeah, we probably have a lot of guys now who are big proponents of Taylor Heineke. I think it's probably 50 50 and I think it depends on the money. Heineke's going to be what, 29? Yeah, he, and he hasn't played a lot. Of, it's not like he's, you know, working on his third contract or anything. You know, he's had two good years money wise. He's not going to get any taller. He's not going to get a stronger arm. He's, no. he's, he's what he is. No, but if somebody calls him and says, hey, we run a similar offense. 
we're going to, we'll, we'll give you $5 million to back up our guy. If someone says, Hey, we run a similar offense. He needs to be like, <laughs> <laughs> I would just outbid. I would, it'd be like the transition tag. I'd, I'd, out, I'd say, you know what? We want you to be here as well, a backup and we'll pay you more than anyone else is going to pay you. More, it's don't change. I'd like more to see more, that. I was ready to move on. Cause look, one thing I will not be able to stand in, in, Mark and Chris, I think you'll be able to appreciate this when I say this. One thing I won't be able to stand is the stupid radio calls if Heineke's the backup. If we were to endorse somebody like Howell, because every time he, you know, airmailed a ball or threw an interception, because yeah. it's going to happen, all you're going to hear is, well, Heineke's on the bench. Play Heineke. That guy's a winner. He just knows how to win. Look at his record, blah, 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 all that bullshit. Oh, I can solve, I can solve that. The, the minute they go to call in, I changed the channel. <laughs> well, but more and yeah, more. Yeah, the Heineke coming, is strong, man. You're right. <laughs> more and more, I am coming to the realization that if we're just going to sign some veteran that's walking the street, you know what I mean, to be a bridge guy, why not just sign our veteran? I mean, yeah. if we're going to pay somebody $6 million, $7 million a year to come in here to compete with Howell and – a third round quarterback that we draft in the upcoming draft. Why not just our guy that already knows this locker room already knows Rivera already knows this team. I, I love Heineke. The only reason I would even say I, that I was even concerned about Heineke was because I don't want to deal with listening to that nonsense with all the Heineke hive people that are like that to this day, we'll still argue that he's the best quarterback, that he needs to still be starting, that he blah, 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 whatever. Okay, you can go talk to the corner. I know what John's thinking. It's the best you know I mean? quarterback like, we've had since Theismann. It's going to happen. And if we if we invest in the future of this team, and Heineke is a part of that future as, as a transitional piece, it's going to happen. We're going to hear that. But I think the team is going to be better off for it. And at that point, Ron Rivera is the one that needs to deal with it, not me. Like, he just needs to say, no, we're going with Hal. That's our guy. The Or if he wins the job, let the two of them compete. How the, the better of the two will come to the top, you hope, right? And it's going to be inexpensive. And if if Heineke latches on, I'd love that guy to be here for the next five years, six years as a backup, and it, and everything be awesome because we love the guy. He's, he, you know, he's, he's the Reed Dowdy of quarterbacks. But <laughs> so, but. <laughs> but that's true i'm I'm more and more open to that opportunity because because what the fans do on the radio should not have any impact on what's best for the team well i hope it doesn't he can, it has he, since he, can been here. he could do all kinds of stuff with these days here there's somebody here who is he if he goes to uh the colts He's nobody. He's somebody. That means there's value in that. Right. We got T-shirts with him on it, man. We got T-shirts. Mul multiple. <laughs> I multiple. Have one, I, have, I got. I'm gonna. I, I'm gonna forget. But I have one point. I just for if I can quickly go back to the press conference, which my overview of is it went from ridiculous and then transitioned into an SNL comedy. <laughs> I don't know how many people had the the stomach to get to the end of it, but at the end of it, Rivera was asked about starting slow you know every season they start slow and he actually with a straight face said that because this summer was hot they had so many soft tissue injuries and he was going to have to look into how to adjust things because of the heat of training camp aren't all training isn't it hot everywhere where there's a training camp for the most part everywhere south of pennsylvania they run yeah. they the dolphins train in florida in, in July and August, for God's sake. Hey, go to go to Atlanta in August and tell me how your soft tissue feels. Houston, you know, I mean, it's... Um... But I got your soft tissue, Ron, right here. <laughs> you know, that brings up a that brings up a thing that, that I am curious about. And it, it, he, he did it, he said, he and Mayhew talked about, was that they had to sit down and, and look, at, investigate why we had so many injuries at the center position. Yeah. And I find hey, hey run, run. Is this a, check the last 20 years? Okay. Oh, for the for the the three years leading up to Ron Rivera taking over, weren't we the most injured play team on the in the in the NFL? 
Yeah, but not necessarily at center always. I mean, it was it, always at O like line. Every year we go through two or three centers. Every year under Ron. Now maybe that's just because Chase and, and Tyler are injury prone. I don't know, but hey guys, I want to ask you a question. Do we need a new kicker? <laughs> Uh, I suspect Mr. Sly will not be the only kicker in camp if he gets that far. I don't. I think he's. I think his contract expires, so they would have to re-sign him to bring him yeah. back. I mean, there's nothing special there. I think they're going to bring in a bunch of guys and hope that somebody emerges. I think he'll be back for training camp. I don't know that he'll be on the opening day roster. We may have to try and consider going for two more often because, as far as I'm concerned, and. <laughs> Uh, from my eyes, he was pretty solid with uh, field goals uh, earlier in the year. If you go back and look at the stats, like it took a while before he actually missed the field goal in a Washington uniform. But oh my goodness, the extra point situation, especially towards the end of the year, was god awful. You might as well go for two at that point. So got the, he's got the yips. Yeah. Do we think? Do we think Virginia Tech has any any blame in this whole thing? <laughs> I don't know. Fly a hokey? Ask him. Yeah, I think well, so. They, yeah, just, there's a long just, line of, <laughs> of storied NFL hokies, I'm sure, and at the kicker position. <laughs> they just keep Sly around to kick uh, 50 plus in the city right. of Philadelphia and everything else is. So. We're old enough. Remember when we had two kickers? We had Steve Cox for the long ones. And oh shit, was it Zendejas? Oh, it was even it was back in Gibbs one. Yeah. There were a year or two where we carried two field goal kickers. Steve Cox did kickoffs and the long field goals. And then we had a designated field goal kicker for anything like inside 45. We'd have to let Tori Apke go to do that, though. Right. Well, yeah. hold on. Here's, here's, <laughs> here's the other thing. Sly misses them when we have big leads. He hits them when it matters. So, it's, you know, the, the, the context there, it's not like he's uh, missing a field goal to result in a tie against the Bengals in London. I, Last time I checked, that guy's doing pretty good right now. I want a I want a beardless kicker, man. I I can't I can't deal with a beard on a kicker. So, so I was going to look it up before the pod, <laughs> and I never did. But they said during the game that we've had I think it was twenty seven starting quarterbacks since Gibbs won. Um, I was going to look up the number of field goal kickers. I don't think it's twenty seven, but I bet you it's, it's in pretty the damn 20s. close. I bet you it's in the twenties. We need to find a kicker that can last more than a year or two here. Well, we've, had well, here, few, but we've sent them someplace else, and then they yeah, have uh, right. great careers. You know, and who's the other one who's out there getting it done? Here's, Here's the, the other. other uh, no, uh, Hopkins. Hopkins. Cobra, Cobra Kai Hopkins. was out there for a while. Yeah. Wasn't there one that, that <laughs> Dallas picked up and <laughs> for like seven, six years? That yeah. Was, Kai Forbath. Forbath, yeah. yeah. So my my Dallas buddy, you know, Sly, Sly pulled that first one off to the left, right? And they lined up to kick that next one, and my buddy's sitting there on the couch. He goes, I'll bet this one goes to the right side of the field of goalpost <laughs> because he because he overcompensates and he kicked that ball and sure enough that thing went about th two feet outside the field guy and Sky goes, yeah that first one was totally in his head man. <laughs> he kicks like I hit golf balls. Yeah, that's what I was just thinking. <clears throat> so before we wrap up here tonight, guys, does anyone have a man crush on a prospective offensive coordinator out there? I've taken my beating about for suggesting um, Jay Gruden, so I'm going to smoke a doob and let that. I don't go. hate Gruden, man. Like I'm just <laughs> open up to Gruden. Before I, I will say, I'm opening up Gruden. If you heard his interview yesterday, it was hilarious. I laughed. They said they, they they literally asked him. They said, "How hard is it to find an offensive coordinator from the outside?" He goes, "Yeah, it's really hard, especially when you're told what to do." I mean, it because he. I think it would be worth it. it just to see Ron try to deal with him. I can see, I can see Jay being like, "What the fuck are you talking about?" <laughs> <laughs> well, Jay Gruden was a good OC in Cincinnati. People forget that was a Super Bowl contender when he was the offense. He made Andy Dalton look like a, a, you know, the man. Like, and then he came here, and it really starts to make you wonder if Jay Gruden was a lot better than he came across, simply because he had the Grand Poobah up above him. In but the, that's uh, not going to happen. Park. You know that's not going to happen because I know it's not. But but it, does anyone have anybody that they really think it is the answer? I I got one I'm intrigued by. Don't necessarily think it's the answer, and I don't. I definitely don't think that 
it would be the type of guy that Ron Rivera would go after. As I mentioned earlier, Ron Rivera is a guy that plays it safe. And I think that this would be more of taking a risk, but I'm intrigued by uh, Joe Brady, the quarterback coach in Buffalo. Um, he had an opportunity to be an offensive coordinator for uh, a couple of years with Carolina. I believe he was relieved of his duties before his, before the completion of his second year uh, with Carolina. Um, he has had some head coach interviews in the NFL. So in terms of the trajectory, the guy landed an offensive coordinator position, was interviewed for some head coaching positions, then was basically fired. And then, you know, if you think of it, had to take a demotion going back to quarterback coach. He's worked with Joe Burrow in college. He I was going to say, with- that's where he cut his teeth, right? Wasn't he the passing game coordinator at LSU? That's Burrow? right, when it- when they won a national championship. And now he's working with another solid quarterback in Josh Allen. Um, and the other thing is this, in NFL coaching circles and regardless of sport, coaches rely on people that they trust. And oftentimes they hire people that they trust and people that they know. Um, Joe Brady's not necessarily somebody that Ron Rivera knows, even though he worked in Carolina because it was after Rivera had left Carolina. But Rivera definitely has that connection and that relationship with Sean McDermott. And I really think that he would put a lot of uh, faith and a lot of stock into any sort of good word that McDermott would put in for Joe Brady. So You know he's polling coaches everywhere. You know he's called Gibbs three times already. That's, yeah. I think that's how he rolls. So you know he's quizzing Andy Reid and Joe Gibbs and whoever else he can get to talk to him about who should I bring in. There's another uh... – on the Bill staff, there's another offensive uh, guy who just happened to work for Rivera in Carolina, uh, whose name is Mike Shula. Hmm. Um, and I'm just hoping it's not Mike Shula. <laughs> Simply because he coached with Rivera in Carolina. That's no yeah, other and we don't, need, we don't need any more nepotism hires, you know. Didn't, uh, yeah. didn't he, wasn't he the head coach at Bama for a little while? I don't know. <laughs> quarterback at Bama. Didn't he do something for Bama? I don't know. We, we seem few, to have a Bama a, connection, too. There's a few Shulas. So I, don't, I don't have any any particular guy in mind. I, I'll, I'll admit to not being familiar enough with, with uh, the possible candidates. I just would like to think that whoever it is is going to be somebody, A, who understands that this is kind of a weird place, particularly if we're still assuming who, how the new ownership is going to work out, how long Rivera is going to be here, et cetera. But somebody who can look at the roster that we have right now and would be able to make sense of what I would do with this receiving core, if Brian Robinson and presumably Sam Howell, what, what kind of offense would I want to run? What do I think I can run? And do I think I can talk my head coach into getting me some assets on the offensive line so I can, so I can get something done? It's going to have to be somebody who's a little bit of a salesman, I think. And I would love to see somebody who, who is not in, in what Paul fears is the likely thing. A, a safe choice would really bother me. I'd like this to be an aggressive choice, but I just don't think Ron's going to do it. So, Mark, hey, Mark, just... are, you, are you saying that you want an offensive coordinator that can adjust their approach and <laughs> their game plan to the talent that he has? I, I'd mind? like to give that a try. Yes. Wow. <laughs> wow. Just Radical. for clarity's sake. It's crazy, isn't it? Just and for maybe, clarity's sake. And maybe even somebody who, and and I mean, I think we all remember when Joe Gibbs got here back in, in 1981, he came here to institute Air Coriel and throw the ball all over the park, started 0-5, and said, well, this isn't going to work, and redid the entire offense in one week and then went on to one of the great runs in NFL history because he adapted and, you know, had Riggins and was a brilliant head coach. So, yeah, somebody who, I mean, nobody saw he, Joe Gibbs coming. He wasn't on anyone's radar when he came. Anti-Rivera is what he was. Well, I mean, they Jack Kent Cook, well, Bobby Bethard brought him in because Bethard took a look and said, hey, this guy's got some smarts and maybe he's, He's one of these guys who studies and sleeps in, in his coach's office every week, which, by the way, is what burned uh, McVeigh out in L.A. He's that guy. He sleeps on his cot and he's completely burned out. But that's yeah. what I'd like to see in our in our new O.C. is someone who's like, yeah, I love what I see. I see the tools there. This is what I'd like to try to do. Let's make it work. 
I don't, I, I threw a couple of names out because I have a type that I want them to look for. Oh, I, you know, I don't, I, they're, you know, they're probably, they're not going to take an offensive coordinator away from another team. That's a lateral move. Um, I don't see them giving anybody the title of assistant head coach just to, you know, just to get them in here at this point in time. Ron hasn't had an assistant head coach for three years. I don't see him starting now. Um, so I feel like it's going to have to be somebody's coordinating coach, uh, quarterback coach, somebody's passing game coordinator who isn't the full OC, who splits duties, that type of thing. So I started looking around at those kind of guys, but I, I don't have a guy I like. What I have is a process I like. I would like to see Ron interview no less than six people. Don't hire the first guy you talk to. Talk to multiple guys. Um, you know, and and they all need to come from some kind of winning background in terms of current NFL, you know, coaching staffs. I want to see them talk to guys that are off of Kansas City staff, you know, uh, Kyle Shanahan staff. I don't, you know, I don't care. They're, as long as they're in the playoffs, as long as they didn't coach in Dallas, and they didn't coach New England, right? Because New England, New England, or Carolina, assistant coaches, if I may, or Carolina. Uh, but well, I think we've already had the entire Carolina coaching right. staff under Ron here at one point in time or another, at least those that aren't already retired. So, but you know, I maybe somebody off the staff from, from uh, Miami, you know, where they did some amazing things with effectively a first year quarterback. I mean, it's not like Tua, is, Tua had a lot of snaps under his, under his belt when the season started, right? Um, I, I, I want them to, to look at guys closer to the age of the players and granted Turner's fairly close to the age of the players, but who aren't jaded and stuck in a system. The first guy that comes in and says my system, I want him to usher out the door because I'm tired of that coach to the players, not a system. Yeah, I'm right there with you. So just for clarity's sake, as we sign this thing off, Matt LaFleur was not fired today, the head coach of the Green Bay Packers. It was Mike LaFleur, the offensive coordinator of the Jets. Jets yeah. Ah. So Matt I LaFleur, didn't know that the, either. So. <laughs> Matt Thank LaFleur, you. the head the head coach of the Green Bay Packers, is apparently still employed by the Green are they, Bay Packers. Are they related? I believe they're brothers. Facebook friends. Probably. <laughs> Cousins or something. So we kind of came to the end of the regular season here, gentlemen, and, and we're we're moving on now to the off season and all that. I guess that's maybe next week we can take up what this whole process is going to look like. But I, I would like to say at least I know we spent the whole podcast complaining about the reasons why we didn't make the playoffs and Ron and everything else. Fact is, we came into the last week of the season. Would we go into every season thinking, let's get to the end of the year and be playing meaningful football games in, in December? Well, we did that and I enjoyed them. I did. I bought in a little bit, which again, just made the disappointment worse. But I would like to at least say what into the universe. Thank you for a season where I sort of kept kept my interest up until the end of the year. Um, and I have reason going into the off season, particularly with the since we're going to have a new ownership that this this could be like, we could be right at the end of the darkest before the dawn. You know what I mean? It, this might be the beginning of a whole new thing. We may have a quarterback who's competent. So I'm, I'm feeling pretty good, despite the fact that we stumbled across the finish line here in 2023. Got a lot of young talent. We have a, lot, a ton of young talent. That's what, that's what I was going to say. Even if the quarterback ends up not being our quarterback, I think there's still a lot to be happy about with this roster. For the first time, I feel like there are a lot of players on this roster that other teams wouldn't just like to have, but might actively covet, right? I mean, let's face it, our receiving core, I'll put our receiving core up against just about any receiving core in the NFL right now. Jahan Dotson runs some dirty, man, that guy breaks out of his cuts like, <laughs> yeah. like, oh my God. Yeah. And, and got guys coming, that'll be coming back next year, Fedarian Mathis, um, Cole Holcomb, Cam Curl be healthy. If we can keep them healthy, we, we've That's, got a pretty good roster. In, in the pain conversation, we didn't even touch on the fact that we didn't even see our second round pick for more than about a handful of snaps this season. Correct. Who has the same position that Payne has. And was very active when he played. 
He mm -hmm. he jumped off the screen to me a little bit. Yeah, well, no, I, there's a lot to look forward to here. You know, I, 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 a name that we were kind of lambasting last year, leading the leading the team in tackles this year is one Mr. Young Jamin Davis. Yep. Played good ball at a position yep. that we clearly aren't interested in supporting anymore. No, well, I started to say that earlier. First four picks of the draft: two offensive linemen, a cornerback, and a linebacker. Hey, if you're, I know we're, I know we're trying to get out uh, off the net here, but if you guys were the GM, is there any coach on this roster that you're going to try to retain? Oh, Jack Del Rio and the entire defensive staff stays on my roster. Yeah, I'm not kidding me. I'm going. This. The first thing I go to do is Jack Del Rio and say, "Hey, look, I'm not giving you the head coach. That's what I, was I, wanna, <laughs> I want to keep this thing together, buddy. This makes a lot I of agree. sense." I don't. Yeah, boy, I don't know. Maybe, maybe Del Rio. I do. Paul, how do you feel about Matsko right now? Have you have has your feeling changed at all? Uh, I it, it was something I made mention of on uh, in one of the threads that we got going. Um, I had made mention of the fact that I feel that you know we need to reevaluate uh, him. I'm not necessarily saying that we need to relieve him of his duties, but I feel like Rivera, to an extent, got suckered into believing that we can make do with whoever we throw out there on the offensive line because, because of the amazing job that Matsko did the last two years, right? And it just didn't materialize for us uh, this past year. Um, the fact is that John Matsko did not have the all-pro versions of uh, Andrew Norwell and Trey Turner that he had when he was in Carolina. And he also didn't have Brandon Sheriff, who's also a player who can play at, a, at an all, all pro level. So in the absence of those types of players who he's in the past been accustomed to having on his line, we saw a line that completely collapsed. So yeah, coaching factors into it, but there definitely needs to be some talent infused in there. So I'd be willing to give him another shot but uh, to quote I, the great Leonard McCoy, I'm a doctor, Jim, not a magician. I mean, yeah. I don't know that anyone could have. And I wonder if him I and he could have been beat pounding the table last off season saying, I give me some help. What here. are you doing to me? What are you doing to me? <laughs> we don't yeah. know. So I'm, I'm kind of, I'm willing to throw him a little bit of a break. Like, like I hope whoever our linebacker coach is doing, I, I hope our linebacker coach is, is standing in the, in the meeting rooms, beating, you know, beating the drum for more talent at linebacker too. You, but. you convinced me of his greatness, so I'm not willing to let it go yet. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm starting to think that maybe that assessment was wrong. So, well, no, well, I and I sandbagged you by asking the question. I absolutely don't want to let the guy go because he's shown what he can do in dealing with the, the amount of injuries we had last year, and he kept cycling new bodies in, and they they were pretty damn good. This year was the anomaly. So no, I'm I'm bringing him back too. Absolutely. Yeah, I give Matt School a mulligan this year, absolutely, and and give him another year to go at it. I I would like to know how much input the position coaches get in the off season into who we're bringing in. I, I've always assumed there's a tremendous amount of it, but good question. Yeah, now I'm kind of wondering. That'd be so, a great so. question for uh, Keimer, one of those guys, to ask. You need to you need to poke them on Twitter and say you know because sometimes they'll they'll ask for questions. So heading into super, the draft. Sorry, go for it. Mark. Super wild card weekend, gentlemen. I assume that you've got lots of bourbon on hand and are ready to to dive in. It's a marathon. We're not playing in it, but I'm going to enjoy the hell out of it. Yeah, I, I'm looking forward to seeing that Jacksonville. Uh, I want to say San Diego, but let's just say Jacksonville Chargers matchup. I, I love Justin Herbert, and I think Trevor Lawrence is going to be amazing. Um, th th those are two particular teams that I see that that I think that down the road we're going to be hearing a lot of with those two guys behind center. So I'm really intrigued to see that matchup. At yeah, young stud there. quarterback, man, you're you, you can you can compete. Yeah, what we're all envious of, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I'm very excited. Uh, which I think we will see will be a Buffalo Bills home game with DeMar Hamlin walking out onto the field. 
I think he went to home the today, hospital right? in a couple of days. Yeah, he got oh, he left from, the hospital. He, out today. Yeah, he went home yesterday, didn't he? And he well, he's going to be at the game. He'll, he'll be at the game. It's going to be great. It'll be crazy. It'll be a great moment. Yeah. You know, oddly enough, they go deep enough into the playoffs. I potentially see him suiting up. How wild would that be? Oh, man, I hope not. <sighs> I would bet <laughs> against that right now. I, I, the only, I, the I only thing I would say is if they get to the Super Bowl, which is, what, a month away? It's not insane. It's not an insane idea, but I think I just, I hope not. Well, if they get to the Super Bowl, my guess is they suit DeMar Hamlin up if for no other reason than just to stand on the sideline. But, you know, he's been part of the team all season long. You don't take that away from the guy. Hold on, but he got put, he, hold on. He got put on IR. I don't know how that changes. Oh, you know, you're right. He did, didn't he? All right. He's done. Doesn't mean he's not on the sidelines, though. Yeah, but I just don't. Yeah. I don't think he's wearing a shoulder pads. Yeah. I can tell you yeah. that. I, I think the game I'm most excited to watch this is. I'm curious about the Dallas Tampa Bay game. Yeah. Never bet against Tom Brady, man. I don't no. know. Especially no. at home. But Tampa doesn't look good right now. Neither does Neither Dallas. Does Dallas. <laughs> right? These are two teams that have literally backed into the playoffs. Mm-hmm. I mean, does, does did Tampa Bay Tampa Bay finish with a losing record? They they pulled a Washington. No, no, no. I think they finished nine and eight. I think they got their head above water at the end of I'm the I'm looking season. at the schedule, but it doesn't have anybody's records on it. So I'm who's a little beat, who's gonna beat Minnesota? I mean, who's who's Minnesota playing? The Giants. That's the, <laughs> the one rematch. Was, that's the, the rematch was, from two weeks ago, which was a really good game. I was just going to mention that one. I'm I'm nervous as hell. I, I think the Vikings Giants are going to win that game. I'm telling you right now, they are. Oh no, you're right. Bucks ended up eight and nine because yeah, they so sat their team and they didn't need to win the last game, so they sat everybody. They were eight and eight going into the final they game. Over Washington, they backed in with a losing record, but they aren't recording. They aren't playing a juggernaut like we were. <laughs> Mark, are you need are to. Are we still recording? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you want to use some foul language chris go ahead it's okay i already said dog shit earlier so <laughs> no no chris is gonna make wild predictions he doesn't want anybody to hear <laughs> paul's gonna ask me who i'm taking and pick them and i ain't saying yeah that's what i was gonna say you gotta reveal all your picks so i can be, uh pick the complete opposites the only no, way i'm just i'm trying to get in your head you. bro and, and i'm trying to figure out what you're gonna do because you're you're like you're hanging right there What's yeah. the difference? Is it three games, four games? Four games. Four, four games. That that's too much of a deficit to. Oh, it's not too much to over. Yeah, you might as well just bag it, man, and just don't even play. <laughs> I think so. Yeah, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna drop in the standings now because I'm going right off the board because I don't think there's enough games to to catch you. So. Yeah. All right. Wow. We'll see. We'll see. A Canadian just lied to you, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Now I'm I having really flashbacks to, to uh, Mark's favorite movie, and, you know, there's nothing more dangerous than fighting a land war in uh, Asia, you know, Southwest Asia or whatever. Yeah. Given, never, given never it all away. An, an intellectual battle. Anyway, <laughs> never mind. We're not going there. You guys rock, man. It's been a fun right. season. Like, uh, thanks for the whole year. We'll yep. Be- I assume we'll circle back next week and maybe jump on. Hey, there, there he is. Oh, uh, look at the puppy. <laughs> Jump back on if there's something we need to uh, address immediately. Yeah, we've we got going? a big, big off season coming, gentlemen. We're gonna have plenty to talk about. That's right. All right, guys. Night. Night.